Now we know what first and second order differential equations look like. Here's a first order. There's a y prime, and that's the highest derivative, so that's what, that's what makes it a first order, the first derivative. There's a function of t in, in front of y prime. There's a function of t, a different function of t in, in front of y. And then there's a function of t on the right-hand side. If this is 0, we call this a homogeneous equation. A second order equation looks like this. The, the highest derivative is the second derivative. There's a first derivative term and a, and a, a zeroth derivative term. Each of, one, each of them has a, a function of t in front of it. There's a function of t on the right-hand side. And these functions of t can be 0. So for example, my, uh, an example of a, of a second order di uh, differential equation might be something like this. Right? There's no y prime term in that. That's OK. That's still a second order differential equation. A third order and a fourth order might look like this. Notice that in each case, we have a p of t as our uh, function in, in front of our highest derivative. And then we go along the alphabet, right? p, q, r, s, as many as we need. And the right-hand side is always g of t. But it doesn't really matter what we call these functions. g of t could be 0. It could be e to the t. It could be the sine of t. It could be any number of things. Um, notice the slight difference, difference in the notation here. Remember that this notation means raise y to the fourth power. And so to distinguish it from that, we call uh, we use this notation for the fourth and higher derivatives of a function. So y to the 17th power would look like this, but the 17th, that's supposed to be a 7, but the 17th derivative of y is that. Very subtle difference, but it's a very important one. So that's what these, uh, that's what these look like, and in each case I can divide through by p of t, making the, the highest derivative uh, have, a, have a, a coefficient of 1, right? So I can do that as long as p of t is not 0 on the interval in which the solutions exist. All right, now let's take a look at an nth order differential equation. Well, one thing to notice, and I'm going to run out of letters pretty quickly here. I, if n is greater than 26, then I'm not going to have enough letters in the alphabet. Furthermore, it's conventional, uh, especially when you're dealing with the general cases, which is what we're implying when we say we're going to talk about the nth order. Um, it's conventional just to pick one letter, one uh, name for a function here, and then just give them subscripts. So I'm going to use p primarily because that's what your textbook uses, and I'm going to write out an nth order differential equation. All right, here's my first function of t, my second function of t, and those carry on in here. I, I don't know what they all are because I don't know how big n is, so this is an indication that the, the list goes on, not indefinitely, but up to n, right, or from n down. And there's some unknown number of terms in the middle here. And then I have this function of t and another function of t. And of course, the right-hand side is still g of t. Now, this notation is, um, I'm just using what your textbook uses because I want to be consistent. Um, you'll notice that the derivatives are going up. I have the zeroth derivative, the first derivative, the second, third, fourth, and so on the derivative, derivatives are in here. And then the n minus first derivative, and then finally the nth derivative. That's what makes this an nth order. So if I start at the, uh, the high end of the list, I'll go to the fourth, I'll go to this one here. If I start with the fourth derivative, so fourth order differential equation, start with the fourth order, then I'm going to go down from that. Sorry, the fourth derivative. I'm going to go down from that. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Here I have to go down from n. Well, what's 1 less than n but n minus 1? And the next one in here would be n minus 2 and then n minus 3 and so on. I just don't know how many there are until I get down to the second derivative, the first derivative, and the zeroth derivative. So that's all I'm doing is generalizing the, the pattern that we see here, but I'm, I'm also using subscripts uh, on, on the function name of p just because I don't I, I don't know how many letters I'm going to need. Um, the other thing to note here is that the convention your textbook is using is that the subscripts 
While the derivatives start at n and go down, the subscripts start at zero and go up to n. So it's not terribly important in that we could call these functions anything we wanted, right? Um, but notice that just so that we are effectively so that we're all on the same page. All right, one other thing to notice is that as with any of the previous differential equations, the previous orders of differential equations, I could do that with any of these. I can do that with this as well, and that is that I could divide through, I could divide both sides by P naught of T. And that would effectively give me this nth order differential equation in this form. Oops, I chose 4 there instead of n. I'm not sure why. The nth derivative of the function with a coefficient of 1 plus some, and I'm just using lowercase p here, times the n minus first derivative, again in parentheses, plus, and so on, down to p sub, well, I didn't put a subscript on here. Still, still going to call that p sub 1, p sub n minus 1, of t times the first derivative of y plus p sub n of t equals, and I'm just going to use lowercase g of t. It is not uncommon in mathematics uh, for uh, lowercase t and uppercase t, for example, to mean completely different things. And in this case, that's exactly what we're doing. We're saying let p of p naught of t divided by I've chosen a bad example here. Let p sub 1 of t divided by p naught of t be equal to little p1 of t, so that p1 of t and p1 of t, it was a lowercase p, this is an uppercase p, mean completely different things. So I can get away with using this little p1 here where I wrote big p1 here, they mean different things. That's not uncommon. Uh, it's also not uncommon for students to just willy-nilly choose a lowercase or an uppercase uh, letter when, when representing something. And so at this point, especially, I would argue, you need to start being careful that you know which one you're dealing with. Are you dealing with an, an uppercase A? Is that really what you mean? Or is it a lowercase A? Now, in order for this to be true, we have to make sure that we know that the, the function p naught of t, this big p naught of t, is not zero on the interval in which there are solutions to this equation, okay? Um, when we have this equation, though, in this form, I'll highlight it, we can say, or we can write it as though it is a linear operator. We take the function y, we do some things to it, and the result is this right hand side. So recall from, let's see, where did we do that? Section 3.2, that uh, the differential equation can be written as, or can be thought of as a linear operator. And so we have this notation here that says that our nth order differential equation is a linear operator, right? This is a function of y in and of itself. Now, if we were going to solve this first order differential equation, we would need to integrate at least, you know, we need to integrate once at some point in the process. And so it doing that integration is going to introduce a, a constant of variation or a constant of integration. And so we would have for that equation, if, if we were dealing with a, uh, an initial value problem, we would have one Let's see, we'd have y of t naught equals y naught. In other words, we would have one initial condition. We would know that for some value of t, when we plugged it into our original function y, it would spit out some, some value, some constant value y naught. And that's going to be true of each one of these, except that in each case, we're going to have to integrate one more time. So in the case of the second order differential equation, we're going to have two uh, uh, initial conditions. We're going to have a y of t naught equals y naught, and we're going to have a y prime of t naught equals y1. So we're going to have a different, potentially, 
different value uh, output value of y when we plug t naught into uh, the function and when we plug t naught into the derivative of the function, right? So we're going to have one. Get the right pen. We're going to have one initial condition here. We're going to have two here. We're going to have three for a third order and so on. And so we're going to need for this nth order differential equation n initial conditions. And they would look something like this. We've got our first set of initial conditions, plug t naught into the function y, and it's going to spit out some function, some value of y. If you have a first order differential equation, you're going you're just you're only going to need one, right? If you have a second order differential equation, you're going to need two. So we have this one and this one. So this let me let me see if I can annotate this here. We have this is what we need for a first order. This is what we need for a second order. And in general, notice that the number of conditions that I need matches the the order of the equation. So for a first order equation, I need one set of conditions, but that the derivative on this is zero, right? So for a second order equation, I need two conditions, but the derivative is one. So I need the derivative to be one less than the number of conditions that I need. I need the derivative to be one less than the order of the, uh, of the equation. So for an nth order differential equation, I'm going to need n, if you count, counted these now, you'd get n of them, but notice I'm starting counting at zero, so the derivative I need here, the highest derivative I need here, the highest condition, uh, is n minus 1. We would call this, in the same way as we did this with uh, first and second order differential equa equations, actually I don't need all of that, back that up a little bit, we would call this an initial value problem, if an adequate number of initial values, initial conditions, are given so that we can solve it right down to the, the, the last uh, constant of integration. We know what that constant of integration is. If we have enough um, initial conditions, we can solve this, uh, an equation like this outright. And we can, we can refer to a theorem that we learned in the previous chapter, theorem 3.2.1, it guarantees that this, this initial value problem has a solution and that that solution is unique. And in this chapter, this is called theorem 4.1.1. It's a really romantic name, don't you think? And that theorem says this. If the functions p1, p2, and so on, all the way up to pn, that is these function here, functions here, the ones that are in front of the the y, y prime, and so on. If those functions, and this one here, g, if they're all continuous on the open interval i, then there exists exactly one solution to this equation. And they're calling it y, giving it a new name here, phi of t, y equals phi of t, some function of t. Um, one solution, y equals phi of t, of the differential equation 2. And in your textbook, this equation is labeled equation 2. So that's what they're referring to when you see that. Equation 2, they're talking about the equation labeled 2. Um, and that solution also, it's, it's, it exists, and there's only one of them. It's unique. And uh, that solution also satisfies the initial conditions 3, which are, again, in your textbook, on the, at the end of the line, you'll see a 3. So it's those conditions there. also satisfies those initial conditions where t naught, t sub 0, is any point in that open interval. So on the interval i on which solutions exist, a solution is guaranteed to exist, and it's going to be unique. I don't know why they didn't call it the existence and uniqueness theorem here, but that's exactly what this is. And I can't really talk and write at the same time. Existence and uniqueness theorem. for nth order equations. So we've seen this before. I'm not going uh, to spend too much more time on it. Um, 
because we've already met it and we've already discussed it really in, in quite a bit of uh, detail. So that's the existence and uniqueness theorem for nth order differential equations. Now, in this uh, section specifically, there are really quite clear subheadings. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this video here and I'm going to pick up again with the next subheading, which talks about the homogeneous equation. And then I'll do a separate video again for the section called the subsection called linear dependence and independence. Another one for uh, the non-homogeneous equation, and that'll get us through this section. All of these ideas are things we've met before. We're just applying them now to equations that have uh, a higher order than one or two. So I'll see you in the next video.